I would like to thank everybody from to coming out to B and H event space on this absolutely beautiful New York day of snow, sleet, and ice. But we're going to warm you up by uh, talking about a nice and warm location and the photography we did there. So first, I want to introduce Olga Tori, uh, my dive buddy, who's an excellent uh, photographer, both on land and underwater, and a fine artist. I'm Larry Cohen. I've been shooting on uh, land and underwater for many, many years. And I also do work at B&H and chat and email. So in addition to uh, Larry's uh, introduction, I would like to tell you that um, Larry and I, we have a very peculiar accents. Larry's comes from South Jersey, and mine comes from uh, Russia. So if you do not understand, please we can talk later. Uh, if we speak fast, listen faster. And we're going to save questions uh, to the end of our talk, but we'll have plenty of time for questions as well. So we flew nine planes and jet and propeller styles. So this trip, just getting to Papua New Guinea was not easy. We had to go from New York to Hong Kong to Manila in the Philippines, and then we flew into the capital of Papua New Guinea, Port Moresby. But the trip did not stop there. We then had to fly to Kimby Bay. We stayed there for a while because we dove with both Walindi Resort and on the liveaboard ship, the Fabrina. Uh, liveaboards are when you stay on the boat and you're able to go further offshore since you're not land-based. When we were finished there, we had to fly back to Port Moresby and fly to the Tufi area. We dove with Tufi Resort, then it was back to Port Moresby. On the return, it was Port Moresby to Hong Kong, Hong Kong to um, back to New York. We took that many suitcases filled with scuba and water gear. Traveling as underwater photographers or any photographers is getting harder and harder. We had three different airlines and um, lots of times gear that we used to carry on, they would not let us carry on. We had to check it, which not only were we, uh, cost us more money, it also made us nervous about showing up to our location without our equipment. Now, um, we ended up at some of the most modern airports in the entire world. Uh, we tried real hard, but I couldn't find the Starbucks. Or restroom <laughs> to fresh up. We used other different uh, means of transportation, like this outrig ca uh, canoe. And we made many new friends. And some of them were not humans. We did enjoy the local cuisine. And we went on different cultural tours. So we are in the ring of fire. So this, these islands are volcanic. But just the scenery is really beautiful. And Resort Tufi, you can see it far away. You know where you are now. Now the outrigger canoes made a fantastic subject all on their own. So we concentrated and took photographs of them above, below, and split shots. And that's the young uh, two brothers, actually. They were very nice to, uh, to be with us and uh, to pose. And you can see, find them underwater and above water. And this young man just was sitting there, and I kind of like the composition of the blue sky, the space of the blue sky and water, and he just sits there as a main subject and in his own deep thoughts. Now, it's interesting. People of Papua New Guinea do speak English because it was uh, run by Australia for many, many years. Uh, the thing is, is there's also 800 different languages in the country. But they uh, speak the main language, uh, pidgin language, plus they all must speak uh, English. So kids in school study English. So you don't have any issues going and you know, be able to speak to them. Now, even when we were offshore on the liveaboard, many times people from the village would come out and greet us. And this is the scene that it was like. And obviously you could see children were so happy to see us and vice versa. For me, it's the first time I saw that 
you know, canoes and these beautiful children and how they were happy, and I felt the same way. They filled my heart with joy, let me put this way. They also brought fruits and vegetables over to, for the boat. And even in the pouring rain and way offshore, you see these young children are coming out in, in the outrigger canoes. So as you could see here, they used uh, um, plants and uh, seashells and flowers for the, to degrade their bodies. And they have different canoes. This one is very narrow, and you can see this young man sits on the top instead of inside canoe. They and decorate the canoes with different plants. And this kind of canoe, as you could see, it's also uh, made for the, to transport a clothes or food or people. And it shows the different kind of canoes. So it's much uh, thinner and uh, narrow tree they made out of it. And uh, as you can see, the young, young man, he also has his uh, plants decorate his uh, back of his, uh, side of his back. And it's kind of very simple design, but also very beautiful and, and very creative. Now here's the local market where you could buy different crafts while you're in the village. Now, betel nut, almost everybody in Papua New Guinea chews betel nut. You could see that it gives them orange teeth and it becomes a problem. Papua New Guinea has a high rate of mouth cancer because of this. It is psychoactive. It, they say it's like coffee, but it's more a little bit like speed and it does get them a bit high. Now, if you live in Papua New Guinea and you have a pig, you are a rich person. It's a currency for them. And when the kids of uh, school age, they are in schools, uh, young mothers or the siblings will take care of the uh, little ones. They have different kind of like a socialism kind of way. So they help each other to support uh, families who don't have uh, parents or for any reasons they need help. So it's a very interesting structure. Now for the festivals, they love to dress up in traditional um, clothes. And you could see here the, for the headwear, they're using different kind of flowers, which is so beautiful. Different tribes will have different clothes as well as different makeup. So it's from different region, and I could see also uh, the headwear looks very different. Yet the same thing, they have always different kinds of uh, bird feathers. We'll very just go through a few of these portraits. Very creative with the simple tools that they have. They create such beautiful things. Now we went on a cultural tour of one of the villages. And as we approached the village, this warrior came up and asked us whether we were friend or foe. And we fast, like, yes, we're friends, we're friends, we are your best friends. But in case we were foe, he did bring his uh, assistant with him. Little warrior. So then the warriors went away, and the dancers and musicians came out. So they used their native uh, drums, and very passionate about it. They, the songs they sang it was very interesting for us, but we could not understand a word. This is one of their 800 languages they were entertaining us with. Now, they also showed us different parts of village life. One of the things is women at the age of 16, it used to be mandatory for them to be tattooed on their face. Uh, this was to show that they were ready for marriage. Uh, this is not the case anymore. They have a choice. So here we can see uh, a man making a fishing net uh, out of the plants. And you can see here they just put on the tree branches and just spread it out and continue doing the fishing net, one of the details. And also this woman's making baskets. And this young little boy helps his father to build uh, a cover for the roof. Now here, this gentleman is showing us how to make fire without matches. He did it faster than it would take me to make a fire with matches. You know that you will be okay if you go with him on a hike. So 
So we, again, want to show some of the portraits and some of the people that we met along the way. And you can see like this woman, which is the wife of the uh, chief of this village, she has the tattoo on her face. This was her choice. So they also love to decorate themselves with the uh, seashells. Seashells, plants, flowers, and feather, bird feathers are the main parts of the decorations. So also more for ceremony, the clubs and the shields are highly decorative. And as a chief of the village, village Bagu with a club, which is a warrior uh, tool. And if you pay attention to his headwear, you could see three horn bills, uh, three horns, I mean, yeah, three horn bills for, for the bird that you can see the next slide. So they use for the decoration, and that headwear had been uh, passed on generation to generation from his father, his grandfather. So this is the bird that they use for the headwear decoration, and you could see on the top there's a few uh, divides. That means how old is the bird is. So it's just like six of them. That means that bird is six years old. So we were actually able to tell when uh, the birds that were on the headdress actually ended up me meeting their maker. Uh, this is a bird of paradise, and many birders come to Papua New Guinea to see these. Also a variety of parrots. So this is called Papua New Guinea uh, pigeon, and which is the largest pigeon in the world. Imagine seeing these in Central Park. <laughs> So now you can see that video I took with my GoPro camera of the kite taking a piece of chicken from my hand. They didn't miss any time. So this one island we were diving off of, everybody had to hold a piece of chicken and let the bird grab it. We also tried to fake the birds out and put some uh, vegetables. They, didn't, they didn't even try. <laughs> they knew. They knew better. So now let's go underwater, which is what we went 25 hours and nine planes to do. So you could see the reefs are very lush. So here, false clown, anemone fish, uh, female much larger than the male. And once they reach the uh, juvenile uh, stage, they go down to the seabed and they find anemone that becomes their host and the home. Now, anemones are poisonous to most other marine life, but the um, clown, uh, anemone fish of all kinds have a mucus, right? That's what yes. protects the fish from the anemone. So the fish gets protection from the anemone, and the anemone gets uh, basically cleaned by the, uh, the, the, the anemone fish. And what also interesting about the, uh, those uh, anemone fish, they have monogamous uh, relationship. So they choose the partner for the, for the life. You could see there's many, many different kinds. It's like over uh, 40 different kinds of clownfish, what we call Nemo. Now they're rather small. Most of the time we were shooting with macro lenses when we were photographing them. But we would also, we'll see you in a bit, the whole scene. When we shoot underwater, water has particles in it. So we want to be as close to the subject as possible. We tend to use wide angle, fisheye, or macro lenses. And also pay attention to the anemones. Uh, this one we call bubble anemones. It has a very different shape, but it's very interesting for photography. Now these magnificent sea anemones are really beautiful because you see the outside come in various colors. And then you have the tentacles, and lots of times there's an anemone fish with it. So these photographs, it's good to use a wider angle lens. Uh, we shoot with micro four thirds cameras. So we tend to either use the Olympus 9 to 18 or the Panasonic 7 to 14, or occasionally also eight millimeter fisheye. This is my shot. I was probably shooting with the 9 to 18. So they come in different colors, green, blue, purple, pink, red, and brown. And you could see in this case, the anemone ended up folding up 
and closing completely. Now here I'm using my 9 to 18. I rarely zoom, but in this case I did zoom close to 18 so I could get a close up of the fish and still get that S curve of the side of the anemone. So humpback damsel fish, it's about two inches, very small, but very aggressive and territorial. You do not want to build your house near his house. What's interesting is these fish, the male car uh, carries the fertilized eggs. Now, we also just like photographing the seascapes. Here, we got a nice big fan, and we know it's large because we want to put a model next to it. This way, we get some scale. This golden damsel fish is very small, and it's trying to hide, and it lives in this uh, whip coral. So here we see more of an overall shot of the whip coral with various fish. And as it. a photographer, you do not want to, if you want to go after the fish, the picture, you do not want to damage the uh, sponges and corals. So you have to be very careful. And they, they know that. That's how they hide away from you. So we called it, uh, um, so the rock sponge on the right is of Larry, you could see he posed for me, and it creates a beautiful arch. Now this site was called Hanging Gardens because of the various um, rope sponges in this area. And I use my white angle. So polka dot uh, cardinal fish, it's a nocturnal animal and uh, uh, preys for the shrimps and very, very uh, slow at daylight. Now, along those hawkfish, these are just in the Pacific. They're really a lot of fun to see. And they're usually on the steep outer slopes of the reef. And they'll be hiding in the Gregorians or black coral, as you could see in this image. So freckled hawkfish is a predator. And it's by itself, it usually sits on the top of the head of a coral and waits for the fish to pass by and then just ambush it. And you could see they end up being in many different colors, but still called the same fish. But sometimes you can see them in pairs, but usually they're solitary fish. <coughs> there are many different kinds of hawkfish, like this coral hawkfish. So here I used, uh, we were on a wall, and I used uh, my fisheye, super wide angle. So, and I used the diver uh, for the scale to show the size of this uh, sponge, bell sponge. And we just want to show a short video, get an idea of the feel of what it's like to be underwater in Papua New Guinea as opposed to being on the icy sidewalks of New York City today. <laughs> Makes you feel going diving, right? <laughs> and these Moorish idols are found all over the Pacific. With this one, I was able to get the two of them lined up, which, you know, I like the composition on this. Uh, shooting with a macro lens, and we're always shooting with two strobes. We use um, CNC YS um, uh, D1, D2J strobes. Tailspass squirrel fish is very skittish fish. And he thinks that I do not see him, but obviously I see him. And he usually goes in little crevices and holes to hide away. Now, this one, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it. But these in this family, they have protruding tr uh, teeth, and they graze along the bottom. And what they want to eat is snails, worms, crabs, shrimps, and other eggs. Um, they're always very active during the day. So it's hard to photograph them. They're like all over the place, especially with a 60 millimeter macro on a micro four thirds camera. But they do go to bed early and they're the first ones up. Now uh, the leopard grouper, just another grouper and it's interesting it's coloring that it's trying to blend in. And as you can see, they get the name sometimes how they look. So here I also use fish eye and because of the, of the beautiful coral and I put the diver behind to show the size of, of the seascape. Now one thing we're always trying to do in our photographs, if we see background, 
we use the ambient light uh, for our background color. So we'll adjust our shutter speed to get either a light or dark background, and then we'll adjust manually our strobes in the front to balance the light out. Now here, shooting really close, is this juvenile box fish. And I actually thought I was photographing just a piece of dirt. Um, we do rely heavily on our dive guides. They tend to know where things are. They're good spotters. This dive guide got very excited. And he's pointing with this metal pointer. And I'm thinking, it looks like a piece of dirt. But he's excited, so let me photograph this. So I did, and then once I put it on the computer, I'm like, wow, that piece of dirt has an eye. Um, and you could see how small it is just by looking at the size of the grains of sand on the fish itself. It's a half of inch, so it's very small. So yellow strip a spotted blenny, uh, it's about also two inches and has big eyes and usually feeds on a algae, on a rocks. So the yellow scrub pipe fish, we really like seeing these guys. They're very, very small. Um, like most pipe fish that are the same as seahorses, the uh, males carry the eggs. Just see a different angle on them. So collared razor fish, a lot of the sites that we dove, especially at Tufi, was almost all rubble and not very pretty. But when you look closely, you would see the most amazing creatures. And like I say, a long snout, uh, clean gobby, you could see just at his snout. So again, you get the name because of how they look physically, the physical appearance. So again, going to the uh, fish eye super wide angle, and s using the slow shutter speed, I would like to show a beautiful blue color. And then uh, I love this red, um, the sea star, and using uh, the dive guide, using the torch, so you can kind of draw the line and get your attention to the diver and the star. So it goes the same here, uh, using the uh, fish eye. So it, like I say, you can use, we cannot, remember, we cannot change the lenses underwater. So once we go on a certain dive site, we have to investigate what kind of dive site, what we can see, it's a macro, or it's a wide angle, then we take only once, uh, one lens. And you always see the most new little creature when you have the eight millimeter fish eye on. And then you always see the whale shark when you have the macro lens on it. So you have to make your choice. The false stone fish was about like also two, three uh, inches, very small, and really blends well into the sand. Because again, you have to use uh, strobes in order to separate the background and the fish. So that's why we have our strobes on arms. And the arms are two sections, usually two. I have them on two eight inch sections. Olga has one 8-inch section, one 10-inch section on each side. So here she had to move the lights to the side and side light this animal to get texture and to separate it from the background. And likely this particular animal doesn't go anywhere. It's very slow. So um, these, um, these blennies, um, they feed primary on algae from rocks and stones. And you just see them, and they're sitting there as they feed. So they're relatively easy to take photographs of, even though they're very tiny. So then, as soon as you get in position, it decides to hop to the next area. So woody scorpion fish is nocturnal predator. It just sits and waits for the fish to pass by and then ambush it. And also, it doesn't like to swim. It usually kind of moves on the sand, uh, slowly propelling by its fins, fins. And as you could see, they're really good at camouflage. You could barely see that there's a fish there. So these two-striped damselfish, these guys are really little, but they could be very aggressive, and they're very tutorial. So they don't want any other fish in their area at all. Indian lizard fish just sits and waits for the prey to pass by, and usually it bursts itself in the sand. So here, actually, I use my 60 millimeter, uh, uh, millimeter lens to take the portrait of the fish. And here, actually, there are two of them. And they're like little dragons, just sit on top of the uh, sand or a coral and just wait. Here, I just want to get it to the side. So on this image, one, I'm sh my angle is I'm shooting in and shooting up just a little bit. 
I'm using a faster shutter speed because I want to get a dark background so the fish pops out more. Now, most of the dives we did were off boats. We're going anywhere to five to six miles offshore. At Tufi, one of the best sites was right where the boats pulled up. Um, the dock right there, you would go under it and you never knew what you were going to see. Here was a large uh, group of the big-eyed scad. So twin spot garbies, they are, you, you can find them usually in a sand or a very leafy rubbles. So these fish were very entertaining to watch. They seemed to hop along the bottom. They were always in pair, pairs, and they just kind of hop all over the place. Not so easy to get an image of them where you actually see their heads. Lots of times they turn away from you. And it makes sense because the two spots are supposed to look like eyes to scare away larger predators. They remind me also, like when you go to Center Park to take pictures of butterflies, like they hop from one flower to another one. It's not easy to take photos of that. They're exactly the same. So the sea cucumber actually is a nocturnal animal. During the daytime, you can see him just sitting in the sand. But at night, he goes and he goes and hunts. And usually, actually, in India, they use them for the human's consumption. So another sea scene, which we just really love seeing instead of seeing what it's like outside. So the hairy ghost pipefish, again, a master of camouflage. So they could change colors, so they blend in where they are. And once they find a spot, they could stay there for days, because apparently they don't like to change colors that much. And unlike other pipefish, um, they, in this case, the females do carry the eggs, not the males. Napoleon snake eel usually makes holes in the sand and just by itself just sit there and uh, doesn't have any other partners or any other friends. Very solitary uh, animal. So the black spotted puffer, I just like the markings on this fish and like the fact that I was able to frame them within the coral on the wall. Same with the uh, yellow tail fuser, just a very pretty fish that we see as we're swimming along, catching this one in open water, adding some negative space, going with a medium shutter speed to get the background a nice dark blue to contrast with the lighter blue of the fish. And here the same fish as he kind of rests inside the sponge. So on the wall you could see a huge uh, barrel Sponge. Sponge, right, and that's actually me far away. And again, just using a diver for the scale to show the size of the wall and uh, marine uh, life. I'm actually maybe nine inches away from that sponge. Did you use a wide the, angle? Using a nine millimeter um, and having it zoomed to the widest part of the lens. Crocodile fish got the name for the resemblance to a crocodile, the one that we know on the land. And it's actually related to scorpion fish and stonefish. So it just sits on the bottom and waits for the fish to pass by and ambush it. Now we were shooting with macro lenses. The eye is very interesting. A lot of photographers will concentrate on just photographing the eye. I wanted to pull back so I could see that it is a crocodile fish and yet get an angle where you could see the eye. Slender pinjana snappers, they actually come in big schools. Uh, they're about maybe like six, seven inches. So using a wide angle lens, being able to catch the school. And the same with these bluefin uh, trevally. So when you're looking at a wall and you're diving and concentrate on shooting the wall, you still want to look around, look out into the blue water, look up, look down. You never know what you'll see, especially in the, on the islands of Papua New Guinea. Now on here, I'm on the wall and I saw this little coral cave and I decided to swim in it. And I was very happy to see this uh, saber squirrel fish coming in. So the available light coming in was rather dim from the angle I was at. So I had to go down to like a 15th of a second. And I kept lowering my shutter speed each time. And I wasn't happy until I was down to 15 to get the blue and get the blue coming in like that. With the uh, 
in body stabilization on our Olympus cameras. That helped, and also water is denser than air, so having that, that heavy density of the water helps you keep the camera steady. And beautiful sponges along the wall, different colors, <coughs> like this one. And these batfish just followed us along on some dives. They were like puppies. So you know the seascape, and you could see the side, using my fish eye for the same reason, but I could see how much of big, beautiful growth on the walls. You never know how funny looking some of these animals are. It's a, called a unicorn fish, and we looked it up, and we're like, what's this fish? A unicorn fish. Well, what else would you call it? So blue ribbon eel is the family of the uh, moray eel. And what's interesting about them, they use this flared nostrils to attract the fish. The thing is like little, little like, a, like a, a worm. And they go for that, and he just ambush them. Also, when these fish find a spot, they'll stay there for months or even years. So that kind of explains why the dive guides that are there every single day in diving will know, OK, if I take these people there, they're going to be excited to see a blue ribbon eel. It's kind of the same with our regular moray eels. And we see these in the Caribbean and all over the world. But we also see them in Papua New Guinea. So brittle star uses its long arms to move flexible arms to move along the uh, sea floor for locomotion. So another seascape uh, uh, photo to show us you again the same thing. You're using the slow shutter speed uh, to you can fit in the, uh, um, the uh, la uh, la uh, sponge and corals and the diver together. Now when we're doing these wide angle shots, we have to, when we buy a housing, we use Aquatica housings. The housing does not include the, the port. So if you just buy the housing, there's a big hole in the front, and it will let water in. So you have to buy that port. Now, what port do you buy? You buy one that has to match the lens that you're using. A lot of the systems, like Aquatica, they'll have a couple different domes, and then we use extensions between the housing and the dome, to, or the port, should I say, to extend it depending on the lens that we're using. When we're using wide angle lenses, we use dome ports, so they're curved. Um, there's a couple reasons. One, so we don't get vignetting. Also, everything looks 25% bigger and closer underwater. The dome port corrects this, so when we're shooting wide angle, the wider the better. We don't mind using a flat port when we go to um, when we go to macro because we want that magnification. That 25% magnification helps us. Now, this was a dive site called the Arch. And it was extremely impressive to see this big arch. And again, here I'm shooting. I went with, um, because I didn't want the distortion of a fish eye, so I went with my 9 millimeter Olympus lens. And I'm still only about a, two feet, probably, from the subject. On the other side of the arch is a smaller arch, but yet it's heavily decorated with different sponges. So mimic octopus, currently known as only one uh, animal that can mimic so many, uh, I mean a wide variety of uh, animal, uh, marine animals. So it could actually not only change color, it could change its skin texture and of course its shape. What lobster, it's about one inch, maybe even less, and I could see how well he blends into the coral. And I would not even see it unless my dive got pointed out. And it took me a few minutes actually to see it. So using my macro lens, 60 millimeter. So lots of times the dive guide's pointing and going, really? We even said to the dive guides at one point, if we need a microscope to see it, we don't want to shoot it, OK? We want something a little bit bigger. Now, mantis shrimp, um, we got to be careful photographing uh, these, these animals. They could use their claw to attack and kill prey by spearing, stunning, and dismembering. Uh, some photographers have had their port broken uh, by these guys. And their eye is known as the most complicated, complex eye in the animal kingdom. 
And they're very small animals. That's about what five inches, maybe. Yeah. 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 yeah about so five, six inches. The force they use. It's a yeah, very aggressive animal. So crinoid shrimp obviously could see how blends he will blend in crinoid because they have pretty much the same uh, coloration. <coughs> also, very tiny one-inch animal. Again, I needed uh, help of my dive guide to see it. And again, as we're swimming along, some of the soft corals, the coloring. Uh, using our strobes to bring out the color. If you saw this without the light, it would not look this color whatsoever because the blue water is filtering out the red. When your strobes go off, you see the color. So we also use focus lights not only to help the camera focus, but so we get an idea of the actual color of what we're taking a photograph of. So orangutan crab, obviously you can see why he got this name because his fury is brown. Uh, also one inch, very hard to photograph because he moves uh, along with his uh, the, the uh, corals that he mo uh, sits on it and he hides it and comes out, so not easy. Now here I wanted to photograph this cronoid and I just wanted the dive guide there to bring emphasis to it, but then I was very lucky that this little fish wanted to see what was going on as well. Uh, same with these squat lobster, uh, squat shrimps. They're very tiny, but on a given sponge or area, there's actually hundreds of them. It could be in a six inch area. So we got photographs of the grouping of all these shrimp, but I like to kind of do it a little simple and a simple comp uh, composition by isolating one of them. Using my fish eye and showing the seascape and all the growth on the walls, creates very interesting composition and want to put this on your wall. So a tube anemone, when it's just passing by because it sits right on the sand and it has no color pretty much, so it kind of blends in. Um, so in underwater photography, we have the rule, do not shoot down, you shoot up, right? For more dramatic images. So in this case, I said, if I'm going to shoot from the bottom, from the side, it's not going to give me the image I would like to have. So I came over and I shoot down. And that's the image I got. And again, it looks to me like a flower, a sunflower. Rules so are rules made to be broken. Exactly. And this crab is trying not to be seen. But I like them inside this little sponge. And you could see there's two little squat lobsters on the outside, one on the left and one on the right, which I didn't see these until I looked at it on the computer. And I still didn't see it until somebody pointed it but out. But I got to tell you, the pure crab did not see what kind of uh, uh, marine animal you were, but you were size wise, obviously, more than he, big, bigger than he was. That's right. Again, another sea scene using the ambient light and the shutter speed a little bit uh, slower to get a, a brighter blue and using the strobes to bring out the foreground. So when you're actually underwater, I would like just to, uh, because I have a few friends from Center Park are here, and so when you're underwater, you're like in Center Park, but on the surface. There's a small animals, there's a big animals, all kinds of flowers, pretty much that's what it is, but just it's in the water. You got to look in the crevices. This porcelain crab was trying to hide. He was darting in and out, but he came out and I was able to capture him. Boxer shrimp, obviously you can see why he does that, uh, why he got the name, you know, look at the arms, but he also moves the arms like a boxer. Very aggressive uh, little animal. Now, this site was called the Crater, and it actually was a, um, a volcano that's now underwater. It was rubble, it was, as you could see, the background brown and black, but just like under the pier at Tufi, by looking and looking closely and with the help of our dive guide, we were able to see some really interesting creatures in this area. So now we can see the uh, sea. The, well, this is a nudibranch, and okay. now we're gonna show a series of these. Nudibranchs okay. are, um, are snails without a shell, and they come in a variety of different colors. Each species could be very, very different. There are some photo underwater photographers that all they want to do is photograph nudibranchs. And you could see why. So here we can see the nudibranch going down to visit her friend, which is a, a Christmas tree worm. Now the Christmas tree worms are very hard to photograph. Olga, how close are you here? I uh, may be like uh, three inches away. Okay, so you're doing this. 
she, Olga was very lucky that that Christmas tree worm <coughs> is still open. Usually when you get that close to them, they will fold up. Actually, I'm surprised it didn't fold well, up with the nudibranch getting so The close trick to it. is that uh, when you go, when a photograph that kind of animals, you do not want to breathe and scare with the bubbles. You kind of inhale, hold your breath, and slowly proceed, position yourself, and then take a shot. Now, for those of you who are divers out there, they say the first rule is not to hold your breath. Well, sometimes we break that rule. Photography wise, you do have Just to make do sure it. you're not going up in the water column while you're doing that. So again, we're going to show a variety of nudibranchs in the different colors. This one's just so beautiful, almost black with the blue lining. I don't know who designs these. Nudies come in different shapes, sizes, and colors. So some of them could be like one millimeter, two inches, and maybe sometimes four inches. We've actually seen large ones. In, in, in Spain, we saw ones that were almost a foot. So that's the other thing. These, of course, we're seeing in Papua New Guinea where the water temperature was sometimes as warm as 90 degrees. Uh, I think um, 80 was the coolest the water was, but we've also photographed nudibranchs in British cold water of British Columbia. Uh, and occasionally we get them in the waters off New Jersey. So as you could see, uh, I'm not going to even pronounce this one, but I could see it's a different uh, shape, different colors, and also move differently. So this one, pure white. We got to be very careful on how we're going to light this so we don't blow out and still have detail. Olga's using two strobes, but instead of having the center of the strobe onto the, onto the subject, she's feathering it out, so she's using the softer edge of the strobes. And also, when you photograph little uh, animals like those ones, um, you have to be aware of the surroundings. You do not want to damage the marine life or corals or sponges. So you have to be kind of, your uh, trim should be appropriate. And here we got two of them. And just look at the different patterns. This one being white with orange dots. Now this one I just find so strange. It looks like it's a piece of candy. And this one with the yellow on the bottom. We wanted to get photographs of this one from different angles. And he also kind of sat up so I was able to get really close and do a nudibranch headshot. So the same subject, you can uh, take photos from different angles and it could be a very different picture. And we don't really know what these are, but they're, uh, they were just very interesting to see on the wall. Now, uh, Papua New Guinea, there was many battles of World War II there. Uh, here we're seeing Japanese Zeros, which are made by the Mitsubishi company, same company that makes the cars. These two happen to be in the air. This one is not in the air. Uh, this plane is in extremely good shape. Uh, it's in about 60 feet of water and it's close to the shore and there's rivers feeding into the water. So instead of having that bright, beautiful, clear blue water that we had when we were on most of our dives, it was very murky. It was like diving in New York on a bad day. Not a good day, but a bad day in New York. But this plane, um, because it's not damaged much, it's believed that the pilot ran out of fuel. So he wasn't shot down, but he had to ditch the plane. At that time, and with what was going on in Japan, that would have been a real loss of honor. So the pilot was never heard from again. It's believed that he either went and lived a happy life in the village, or since cannibalism, was definitely part of village life at that time that he might have become dinner during a festival. Now here we got Olga looking into the cockpit and you could see some of the controls and see the little bait fish that made their home and they're always there inside the cockpit of the Zero. So just swim around and just look into different parts of this uh, and hold piece of the plane. This is a cockpit. 
So there was another plane that we uh, went uh, diving on, and the visibility was actually much worse. It was like zero, uh, zero uh, feet. Uh, it was an uh, American bomber, military plane, uh, American bomber B-25. Now, it was interesting to be in such low visibility, but, you know, the plane is very unique with its double tail, which is where, when we first approached it underwater, we saw. But looking at the, you know, photographs like this one, what looked to be the most interesting would be the gun turret in the middle of the plane. So I used my fish. I did not use my uh, strokes for the reason because it was uh, very murky and uh, I did not want to have any flare on my on, on ascent. So I used my fish eye and I literally like one inch away from that subject. But if you see the guns right there. You could see there still is interesting growth on the guns, but the visibility is not very good. And there was a, ba a bad fish that made the plane at home. Going back to some pretty blue water, um, we saw this large school of barracudas. One of our diver friends with us got close to shoot some video. I wanted to do an overall shot. What I find interesting is that the barracudas in the Pacific that are there are not as large as the barracudas that we get in the Caribbean or as far north as North Carolina here in the States. But we don't get them in large numbers like that either. So here you could see me by the sponge. Uh, Olga's got me more against the wall, so she's, her shutter speed wouldn't matter that much. And notice my camera. So you could see that I got a dome port on because I'm shooting wide angle. Now, uh, again, another uh, sea scene, and lots of times we like to use divers in these. Now, these hawksbill turtles um, acted very different in Papua New Guinea than other turtles we've seen. So I'm taking this video actually with my GoPro, which is mounted on the top of my camera. And um, as you could see, I think she was very lonely. And uh, now, now I know why my dome was scratched, because she put her foot on it. Um, but she was very friendly, too friendly. As you could see, now she goes to Larry, and almost like attacking Larry, because she want to play with you. And I'm just trying to get a photo. And because she's so active, we're going to, you know, the sort of with the turtles, you want to either straight ahead or shoot it up. And she was all over us in two faces. Now I'm just feeding her the, uh, the, um, the algae that is on the coral. And she looks very uh, hungry, hungry, <laughs> angry and hungry. <laughs> so, um, so sometimes I just let my video go when I'm taking up photos. And here we have our dive guide feeding the turtle. When we first saw the turtle, we were kind of like, let's get photographs before the turtle swims off. Well, that wasn't going to happen. She never left us. We <laughs> left her. <laughs> We go over this series of images of that turtle. <coughs> That's what we tried to get, yeah, to get the photos when she was all over us. And lots of times, like I said, we want to be as close as possible to our subject. Even though we both had eight millimeter fish eyes on, here uh, the subject almost came too close. Yeah, that's actually fish eye, right, she right into my dome. Another sea scene. The size of these sponges are just amazing. It's like a huge pumpkin. Yeah. Now, we did do a shark dive where they did uh, feed the sharks to bring them in close. And silver sh uh, tip shark actually very aggressive animals. And they also actually uh, they uh, feed on big fishes on small sharks as well. Now they do, the females once a year will give birth from only one to 11 pups. And they are fished, so their numbers are declining. And it's just such a beautiful creature to see. So I used my fish eye, and uh, I was on, low on the wall, and she came over my head, and I took the shot. Again, shooting up, you get good many images. Now, I asked the dive guide, I said, put some of those dead fish right in front of my face. The shark came and grabbed it and turned as I pushed the shutter button. But with the fish eye, I ended up with this interesting angle. Uh, besides the sharks, other fish 
want to be fed. So this little video that will go also sped up a little bit, but it gives you a little bit of idea of the chaos that goes on on this kind of dive. Again, I'm just using my GoPro camera. But you can see we just clinched the wall, and it's actually very deep. So we clinched the wall, and we let just the sharks to pass by and take photos of them. So it's uh, lots of lots of locomotion going on, a lot of action. After the dive, we were so hungry when we looked at how those guys were hungry. Now on this seascape, I wanted to try a little bit different lighting. So I used the fast shutter speed because I wanted a bit of a dark background. And instead of feathering my strobes out, I feathered them in to try and create a spotlight effect on the chronoid um, in the foreground. Uh, we haven't experimented with uh, snoots yet, but we are probably going to this dive season with small subject. But I think this one works with still a spotlight effect, even though I'm using uh, two strobes. Now on this, I was shooting the whip carl, trying to get the scene, when these two divers passed by. And um, I was glad they passed by. And when we got back on the boat, they said, we're sorry we ruined your shot, getting in your shot. I said, actually, you guys helped my shot. So sometimes some a bump helps, right? Sometimes it works well. Exactly. Um, so those pilings, when I saw those pilings, and I said, hmm. So I put my dive guide, I said, can you just stay in, be in between? And we have the boat to the right, as you could see it. Because I, I like the seascape, how it looks on the water. And I use my fish eye. That's why I could see the, pi the piling a little bit bent. So after a dive, no matter how pretty it is, and uh, I dive double tanks, so I don't have to worry about air and could concentrate on my photography. It's still time to, to get off. back on the boat. So we want to thank Tufi Resort, Walindi Plantation Resort, and the dive boat for Brina for taking us to this beautiful, beautiful locations. Uh, PNG Air was the airline we used domestically and they did a great job. They're the only airline that goes to two feet. And they all kept us safe and they fed us really well. Um, there's our websites if you want to see our work from other locations. And if you have uh, questions about underwater camera equipment, you can reach me here at bnh at uw at bhphoto.com. So again, we want to thank everybody who did come out and slip and slided all their way to Ninth Avenue. And for those watching at home on the internet, we hope you're nice and warm. <laughs>